Excellent. If you have your word with you today, join me in Acts chapter 4. We have Bibles uh, here in the pews for you. So if you didn't bring one, I know some of you walked in today and said the hymnals are back. I didn't play a mean joke on you. These are Bibles. Um, If you do not have a Bible, and I've already had a friend that's asked me today, he said, can I have one? I said, absolutely. We believe in the word of God that changes our lives, changes our hearts, and transforms our world. So if you don't have one, please, that's our gift to you today. Acts chapter four. My name's Josh, by the way, lead pastor here. I didn't introduce myself earlier. And we've been working through the book of Acts and we'll continue to do so this summer. A series called The Model Church. We want to know what we should look like so that we can become what we should look like. And you know, thinking back through my life to this point, I really believe, um, as my parents told me, I really believe that I could be anything I want, right? I mean, we, my generation, and I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, I'll just let you guess. Um, But we grew up with our parents telling us, little Josh, you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. And guess what? We believed it. And so I think really for our, for our young adults, for our youth and for our kids who are in the back and for our younger um, men and women right now, we, we have a deep desire to change the world. Youth, am I not right? Are y'all awake? Yeah, some of you. Thank you, Noah. God bless you, friend. I'll give you your money after church. Yeah, but I want to do something for the Lord. I don't want to just sit and, and rust or rot and then I get to the end of my life and I realize how much I've wasted. I mean, how much time I've wasted on TV and mindless entertainment or those memes that, that are all over uh, the world. And we just get lost in that. I was listening to the radio today, or actually this week, and they said the grumpy cat died. You know the grumpy cat meme? So I wrecked some of your weeks. Um, the cat, there are nine life left this week. Um, And so the grumpy cat's no longer with us, but how much time we spend on mindless memes and plans that do not matter, squandered on, you know, squandered on being mentally absent for our families and for our wives because we've wasted our time at work. We've used all of our energy chasing the wind or these plans that we make and projects and meetings and busyness and being religious or on to the next best thing or the hopes and dreams. And I look, look back and I realize, look, do these even matter in eternity? Yeah, I don't want to waste my life. And I get to the grave and say, God, I, I didn't do anything for you. I want to be bold And that's my heart for us as a church and for a community that we are bold in our faith, that we're not content just to play this on Sunday mornings, but that we radically want to change the world and be bold in our faith. And I I believe, I'm convicted that we live in a world that desires boldness. Whether they know it or not, they they want something greater than themselves. And I can prove that very simply through marketing, right? Some of you have used, and I've used it in the sermon, and the notes are online. We type in bold-faced fonts. I don't think that's by accident. You can buy chips at the grocery store, Frito-Lays. You can buy the bold pack. Some of you like the bold pack. You can even purchase bold hairspray that will keep your hair in perfect symmetry. And whether you admit it or not, Don't raise your hand. Some of you watch the bold and the beautiful. Now, what is our world telling us? We want to be bold for something. We desire boldness. And with that, we're gonna look at the early church. We're gonna look at a man named Peter that was bold for Christ. And my desire, the title of the sermon today is simply just a bold people, a bold people. So how do we get to this point to Acts chapter four, verse one. So Peter and John are going to the temple as they do constantly, probably every day. And and they're going to this, they pass this gate and the gate's called Beautiful, named after me, obviously. And, And there's this man who's lame, 40 years old, the scripture tells us. And he's been there every day at this gate. 
And so he's there because his parents want him to beg for money because he's disabled. And in the ancient world, there was nothing he could do. In an agrarian society, you can't plow the fields if you can't walk. And so they drag him to this gate called Beautiful, again, named after me. And Peter and John walk up. And so he's begging for money. And Peter looks at this man and says, "What? Well, some of you know it in the King James, All right, silver and gold have I none. But what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ, may your pockets be full. No, that's not what they say. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And so what we have in Acts chapter four is you have Peter and John and the not so lame man standing. This is the picture where we pick up in Acts chapter four, beginning in verse one. While they were still speaking to the people, that's Peter and John, the priest, the captain of the temple police and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them and took them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So we don't know if this is 5,000 more than what we talked about last week at Pentecost, or 5,000 total, or just 5,000 men. So maybe it's another 5,000 women and 5,000 children. But whatever's going on with the community, they're hearing the word of God, lame men are walking, and the religious Sanhedrin gathers the group and says, okay, we need to stop this. So before we look at that, let's pray. Father, we simply ask right now that we would understand your word. Lord, we know we cannot understand eternal truths without the Spirit of God opening our heart and giving us the faith to believe and the strength to serve. So Lord, we ask that you do that for us. Father, if there is someone here that does not know you, Father, if they are the lame man, I pray that they would hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he lived a sinless life, that he died for their sins, and that you are calling them into relationship today if they believe. We pray that we would believe and that you would transform us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So verse one, bold truth number one in verse one, a powerful gospel annoys a power hungry world. A, a powerful gospel annoys a power hungry world. So look what is going on, right? So Peter is preaching in verse one. And who shows up? We have an interruption in the service. People of prestige. We have in verse one, you have who? You have the priest and you have also the Sadducees. You also have the CSB, which is what I preach from, says the temple police or the captain of the temple guard. It's, it's this man named the Sagan, we know in, in Greek. And this was a man who would have been from the family of the high priest. And he would have been in charge of all the security in the area. And we know that the temple captain would have most likely been a stepping stone position to the high priest. So there's some, there's some interested parties here because he knows if I do a really good job, if I make a name for myself and I squash this rebellion, hey, maybe one day I'll be the high priest. And everyone will look at me and, and they'll desire what God is doing in my life. So it's a stepping stone position. And with complete transparency, this is what the word of the Lord says. They gather everyone up, this, this band of brothers, they come into the church or the colonnade and they interrupt Peter's sermon. Why? We see in verse two, because they were, they were grieved, the King James says, I heard, right? The CSB also says that they were, they were annoyed. Something that they've heard has caused angst in their hearts. What could that be? Are they having a theological discussion? I don't think so. It was somewhat theological because for the Sadducees, you know, they, people always say they're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. That this is, so what you see is what you get. You live, you die, you're done. 
And here they go to the temple complex and Peter is proclaiming what? The resurrection of the dead because Jesus has risen to new life. Now, let me again paint the picture. You have Peter preaching. You probably have John here. And behind Peter is who? Standing up. The lame guy. Except he's not lame. He's standing. So can you imagine coming in saying, we don't believe in this Jesus, but yet this Jesus is the same one in the name of that this man who was paralyzed for 40 years is no longer paralyzed. And they're proclaiming this powerful resurrection. And the Sadducees don't like that because they don't believe in the resurrection, but they can't deny the miracles of God. But I think more than this, if there's a resurrection, if they believe who Jesus is, what does Jesus say about life as they know it? When Jesus returns, what's gonna happen? And we've talked about this in Acts. Jesus lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He rose again. And now he sits, and we don't talk about this in church much, but he, he, he ascended into heaven and he's sitting down. He's sitting where? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he's not staying in the seat. One day he's coming again, the second coming. And when he comes again, he's going to reestablish, recreate everything. We have so messed up the world that God's going to remake it. There are going to be new heavens and new earth, which reminds me, don't get attached to this because it's going to be made new. Now, I do, I do believe we see glimpses of eternity in the world. I believe we're going to get to heaven and say, man, the trees are so much greener than I saw on earth. But God, you are showing me a picture of your beauty and your majesty. Man, the fruit in heaven tastes so much greater. But I remember what it tasted because I was able to taste it here on earth. And Lord, it reminded me of your majesty and your glory. And so Jesus, if what we believe is true, Jesus is saying to the Sadducees, I am coming to disrupt your life one day. See, Jesus doesn't let us stay where we are. And I believe the bold claim of the gospel is causing grief in the King James, annoyance in the CSB, because if we're really honest, we're very much like the Sadducees and the temple guard and the Sanhedrin. If we're really honest, most of us like our lives, don't we? And we want just enough of Jesus not to mess up our lives. We want, we're okay living a happy existence and we want God to bless us more than what we have, but we don't want him to come again and change everything. We just want to stay where we are. And the Sadducees understand a fundamental truth. If I don't believe in the resurrection, and Jesus is who he says he is, I got a problem. And if you are here today and you don't want Christ to, to mess up your life as it is, you have a major problem. Because the Jesus we see in scripture, this Messiah radically changes who we are. Radically changes. It's going to annoy the fire out of you. Because that's the power, that's the boldness of the gospel. Are you ready for this bold truth? And you say, well, I don't want my life messed up. It'll be for God's glory and for your good. There is no better place to be than in relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. That is the power of the resurrection. That is the power of the gospel working in us. And the danger that we live is that most of us don't want to change or to be changed. Or we want Jesus to change us in a way that we're comfortable with. And Jesus says, I'm, it's either all or nothing. Do you believe who you say I am? So with all of this, they set up a power play. And so we now have in verse 5, the next day, rulers, elders, scribes assemble into Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the capital. We have the power players of the capital. Think Washington. You have president. You have elite with Caiaphas, John Alexander, and all the members of the high priest family. So here's what's going on. Ancient documents tell us that they would have their councils in a crescent moon. So think behind me. 
right? So you would have this crescent shape with all of your important figures. And on one side, there's a scribe who's taking notes, who's transcribing anything for the defense. And on the other side, you have on this side of the crescent moon, another scribe, and he's writing down accusations. And in the middle of all these people right here, you have Peter and John. So can you, can you see the intimidation factor? Now, if I'm there, I'm, I'm looking at the scribes trying to figure out who's writing more, right? Defense or accusations. And they're intimidating intentionally, Peter and John. And this is going on because they do not want their lives disrupted. They fundamentally want power because a powerful gospel annoys a power hungry world. So here's the power structure behind us, Peter and John in the middle. And then they ask this question in verse seven. They just come out with it. After they had Peter and John stand before them in the middle, they began to question them. By what power? Bingo. This is their annoyance. By what power or in what name have you done this? Here's what they're saying. Who gave you authority in my life? Wrong question to ask. True question, but that was the fundamentally wrong question to ask because at that moment, the inquiry betrays their interest. They don't care about theology. They don't care about the temple. They don't care about Yahweh. They care about who? Don't take my power. And are we not the same way? We live a life, say, God, you can have anything you want, but don't take away my power. Lord, I, I will give you anything, but I don't want to surrender my life. I'll call you Savior, but, but I don't want to call you Lord. And, and Jesus says, but I'm the same. I am not Savior unless I am Lord of your life. And so Peter flips the script. I love Peter. Peter, instead of giving them a defense, gives them a name. By what power do you do this? And Peter simply says this, verse eight. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers of the people and elders. He's being nice right now, by the way. If we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, this guy, I, I can think Peter laying his hands on him and saying, hey, this guy right here, by what means has he healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel and to the people of St. Clair County that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by the way, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead by him, this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So if you wanna know why, by what power we live by, his name is Jesus. Wow. I guarantee you they never asked that question again. By what power? It's as if Peter is relaying the 2 Corinthians 4. We have this treasure in jars of clay so that the extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. Church, let me ask you, are you living out the power of God in your life? If I'm honest, I don't see the power of Christ working out in the church anymore in the West. And if you pull up on Operation World of the Joshua Project, the places in the world today where the church is growing the most, let me give you three of those top 10, just quickly. Number one, Iran. The church of Christ, the power of the resurrection is growing faster in any other place in the world than it is in Iran. Number two, the church is growing faster 
in Afghanistan than any other country. Number four, Cambodia. Number seven, Somalia. What do these places have in common? Extreme persecution and difficulty. That is the power of God. This church is rising up in Iran saying, we can't do anything in our power, but we can do a lot through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So go ahead and bring us before your little crescent moons. Just Google the Iranian flag when you get home, by the way. And we'll tell you the power. It's not of ourselves. It's not in our buildings. It's not in our strength or plans or programs. It is by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. You know what list the, the United States is on? It's in the top 30 least growing countries. I think we are relying on our power less than we are on the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I simply want to ask right now, who has the power and control in your life? Is it Jesus or is it Josh? Who has the power? And it would be wise for us to ask the same question that the Sanhedrin asked in chapter 4 of verse 7. By what power or what name can we do this? It's Jesus Christ. A bold gospel annoys a power hungry world. And it will eat at you until you confess him as Lord and live out in the power of the resurrection. Bold claim number two. Look at verse 12. Exactly where we picked, where we picked it up. And where we pick up and is actually where we left off. He says there is salvation in, by the way, if you didn't get all that about the, you rejecting the capstone, you builders. If you didn't get all of that, look at verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. The Sanhedrin wanted a name. They wanted a defense and Peter gave them a sermon. Typical pastor, right? You want a name? You want an easy power, but let me give you a sermon of the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. Not only is this a name of power, but Peter says this is the name, the only name that people can believe in and be saved. Bold truth number two for us in the church is right here in verse 12. An exclusive gospel is bold for a pluralistic world. And exclude, listen, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you believe in the only name by which men under heaven can be saved. How many other names are there? There's a lot. How many names are there that can, be, that can save? None, none. And so I wanna unpack this, listen, Peter did not give us a list of programs. Peter gave a, di a direct answer and instruction. Peter gave the same exactness that I want an air traffic controller giving when my pilot calls him up and says, hey, we're about to land. Peter didn't say, well, you know what? There's about five runways here that are open. I think you just figure it out. You pick one. Anyone want that air traffic controller? Hey, number three looks pretty good. I don't know the schedule, but if you hurry, you might be able to get there. I want my air traffic controller to say, you know what? Everything else is clogged up, but 31 is open. You have 10 minutes. And you know what I want my pilot to say? 31 looks perfect. Let's go. And so we live in a world that feels pluralistic, but when it, when it comes down to life and death, we actually want to be exclusive, don't we? I don't want my pilot saying, well, there's, I don't like 31. I don't like odd numbers. Give me 30. Give me 32. I want my pilot to say, there's only one runway that I'm going to take. And it is the runway that brings us safely home. That's exactly what Peter does. And Peter begins to unpack these truths and he zeroes in 
and the one name that brings salvation. I believe church, we have lost our conviction that Jesus Christ is the only hope. I believe that we have lost the conviction that Jesus Christ is the only hope. Because we live in a pluralistic world that says this, I'm okay believing in Jesus, but I'm equally okay you not believing in Jesus. Because that's the way we live, isn't it? Well, I don't want to talk to, I don't want to talk to Bill about faith because he might get upset at me. And I don't want him to hurt my feelings. If that's the way we live, listen, I would rather hurt someone's feelings and they find Jesus Christ than them love me and they go to hell. Because I have not opened my mouth about the one name that can save. And we do not push the gospel on people. We cannot convert people by the sword. But church, have we lost our conviction that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? I think we've let our culture teach us that there are lots of ways. Yes, we believe in Jesus, but he's only one way. And so I am fine with someone else living by another way, hoping that one day they will live good enough and that my God will accept them. Let's read again verse 12. There is salvation in who? No one else. This is a language of urgency. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which men can be saved. I simply believe that we do not share Christ because we're not convicted of this truth. We're not convicted of the urgency and the exclusivity of the name of Jesus Christ. Wow, what a powerful name. But it is the name. Are you sharing? In June, we're gonna go out with Crossover Birmingham and we're gonna knock on doors and canvas the Moody area. And we invite you to be a part of that. And to open up doors and tell people, look, there is one name that can be saved, that, that, that calls you to be saved. And his name is Jesus Christ. But here's the power of the gospel. You can be saved if you believe. That is a bold claim. Some people want answers. Instead, give them a name. Give them a name. His name is Jesus Christ. When's the last time you had a gospel conversation with someone because you care so much about their soul and their eternity that you share the name of Jesus? You share the resurrection with people who don't believe. That's exactly what Peter does. Bold claim number three. Let's continue on. So they realize they've asked the wrong question to the wrong person at the wrong time. And then we see in verse 13, they observe the boldness of Peter and John and they realize that they were uneducated and untrained. Literally, the word uneducated and untrained means that they did not have letters. They, they possibly could not even read. And they were amazed and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Bold truth number three. Boldness is found in the presence of Jesus Christ. You want boldness? Spend time with the Savior. You want to do great things in this world? Spend time with the Messiah. That's exactly what has happened. And this, the word here, the boldness, the word that they use for boldness is a Greek word that means freeness of speech. It's almost as if someone who was a slave or could not speak, that now they're speaking about something. They have a new found freedom. It's almost in Peter's life that, that they've actually cracked the dam to his heart. And now there's water, everlasting water spilling out because he's free to share the joy that is in him. You see, the gospel is not a burden, it's a delight for those who know it. And this is the boldness that they have. The Sanhedrin didn't understand because Peter was uneducated. And in the struggle they have, again, let me paint the picture. Yes, Peter is uneducated. He's speaking with such boldness and, and beautiful language about the resurrection and the one who has the name to save. And to his right probably is John. And they're trying to, to deny the resurrection. But to the left, as Peter is speaking with boldness, you have lame guy. 
But no, but he's not lame. He was lame man and he was lame for 40 years and he was begging at the temple gate and now he's no longer lame, but he's standing. And so they can't deny the power of God working in his life because they see the power of God in his life. You wanna be bold? Spend time with the Messiah. And as I was reading this passage this week, really, this is the one verse that began to, to stir my heart and stir my mind and, and really wreck me spiritually thinking, man, if I could only have one thing said about my whole life, it would be this. I, I don't want to be known as a, a great preacher or leader or husband, which that would be nice, or a great father. These are all great things. But if you could only say one thing about my life, I wish that you could look at me one day and say, man, Josh has been with Jesus. He's been with the Savior. There's a boldness and an affection There's a love and a desire. We don't know what's happened, but we do know one thing. We know that he spends time with the one that he says he loves. Can the same be said of you this morning? Would your neighbors look at you and say, Richard, Josh, they've been with Jesus Christ. They don't even have much education. We don't know how he's doing it, but... But one thing that we know, he spends time with the Savior. If that's not you, I want you to know right now that Jesus died so that you would be in relationship with him. That God has designed you to know him and and love him and be loved by him forever. And if you would repent of your sins and call upon the name, the one name under heaven by which men can be saved, if you would call on that name today, you can be saved. But some of you right now are Christ followers and you have not spent the time that you should spend with Jesus. I think we're all, listen, I think we're all in the place where none of us would say we spend all the time that we need to all the time. But I wanna look back on this week and say, God, I I know I've messed up a lot of places, but I have spent time with you. I've been with Jesus. That is a bold claim. Boldness is found in the presence of God. And look at verse 19. So they threaten them. Now, let me just stop really quick. So they're uneducated, unlearned, and, and we see that by the name of Jesus Christ, the lame are now not lame. And so after all this, someone has the bright idea to say, you know what, maybe if we threaten them, they're going to say, okay, we, we're just kidding. We're done. If the name of Christ, if the power of God is so powerful in their life, what is a man's threat? So they shouldn't have asked by what power and authority. And now they shouldn't have, had, they shouldn't have threatened him because we pick up in verse 19 and Peter says this in John. Okay, guys, listen up, Sanhedrin. Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. This is boldness. This is, this is a Bible verse that has carried the persecuted church throughout centuries has carried missionaries that are facing death. You can kill me, you can threaten me, but we are unable to stop speaking about this name, the one that can change your life radically and for for now and throughout eternity. What boldness is found in the presence of God? I want that. I wanna be with my Savior and say, Lord, give me this boldness that when people threaten me, I say, ha, really? Your threats, the the Jesus that makes the lame walk and the blind see, and I'm worried about you? Game on, Satan, game on. The bold truth number four. Peter and John now go to the church and they're released. And and they go and they, they, they tell the church in verse 23, 
They tell their own people everything that has happened to them, all the threats, all the worries, all the trials, all the persecutions. And when the church hears this in verse 24, they raise their voices to God. And they said, so they begin to pray. This is their prayer. Look at verse 29. Wait for it, right? You're thinking they pray that God would strike them down with lightning. No. They pray that the Lord would open up the earth and just eat the Sanhedrin. No, that was in Numbers. They pray that God would send quail and satisfy their their appetites and then kill them. They would just blow up. No, this is the prayer. And now, Lord, in verse 29, consider their threats and grant that your servants, or grant that we also, that us may speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand, not to kill, but to heal more people for more signs and more wonders and that they would be performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God boldly. Bold truth number four. If you wanna live a bold life for Jesus Christ, a praying people are a bold people. Wow, what a prayer. Look, I, I just wanna be honest with you. This is not the prayer that I would be praying. I would be praying, Lord, send the angels with the swords on the scary locust things. And jo- Joel, you know, remember the locust that had the faces of a horse? Like send those guys. Like the Apache helicopters of the Old Testament. Send them. Like I just destroy them. And yet the church says, Lord, Give us the boldness. God, we want, we want what Peter has. Lord, we want what John has. Father, when we're threatened, we just simply say, we can't help it. This is what Christians do. Christians live for Christ. Christians live boldly for the name of Jesus Christ. Christians believe that the resurrection is so true that even if we die, we're gonna be raised again. And the second resurrection is gonna be so much greater than this life anyway. So go ahead and kill us by the glory of God to live as Christ and to die as gain. It's a lose-lose for you, Satan. It's a win-win for those that know Jesus. This is boldness. And I just wanna know, have we lost the boldness in our lives because we don't pray like we should? Are we praying selfless or prayers with the power of God? Are we praying selfish prayers that are consumed with weak plans of the world. I want to pray prayers like like the early church that says, God, consider their threats. Lord, we know that you hear all things, but we know that the psalmist says that before a word is on our tongue, you know it completely. So Lord, you've heard their threats, but God, don't don't protect us. We, We don't really care about that right now. Lord, may we boldly, boldly pray. God, let us speak. God, do great things. And if it costs us our life, if we go to jail, if it costs us sending our kids away to Afghanistan or Iran, by the way, the church is growing so much faster there, they'll probably be better off anyway. God, if we had to send our generations out that the world might know about this name of Jesus, it's worth it. So Lord, boldly work in us. How does it end? Verse 31, when they prayed, the place where they assembled was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. When was the last time your life was shaken by the power of God? When was the last time where where you were praying before God? Not selfish prayers, not God, give me a better car. God, give me a bigger house or God, help my my toenail or, or God, my, my neighbor's not liking me right now, so I'll destroy their fence. I mean, when was the last time that we were really shaking that God do something great in me? When's the last time we believed like that? When's the last time we prayed, God, there's a lame man and 
I know he wants silver and I know he wants gold, but I don't have anything, but I'm gonna give him the one thing that I do have. I'm gonna give him Jesus. So in the power of the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And Lord, we don't just want physical healing. God, that's great, that's temporary, but change his life for all of eternity. The nations are raging as you can go back and read that prayer but they're counting on the people of God to, to hit our faces. And maybe that's your response to the Lord today, that you come to the altar, you, you hit your knees where you are and you hit your face and you say, God, I want boldness to live through the power of the spirit of the living God. I want conviction that there is only one name under heaven by which men can be saved, the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I want the boldness that people can look at my life and say, we don't know what's going on, but we do know one thing. And we know they've been with Jesus today. Wow, that's what I want. That if you go to the restaurant, they say, I don't know what's going on at Bethel, but your face is shining like you've seen someone so much greater than yourself. We're gonna sing a song of response and I just ask you to simply pray like the early church prayed. Say, God, shake us. God, I'm tired of just playing this. I'm tired of being in the Sanhedrin. God, I want to be standing in the middle with boldness proclaiming the truth of the good news. And maybe you're here right now and you think this is too good to be true. And you say, well, no, Jesus can never save anyone like me. I just want to affirm you this way. If God can save me, he can save you. And if you would simply acknowledge your sins and say, God, it could be as simple as, God, I believe today. I know that I have fallen short. God, I know that I have sinned. I believe in Jesus, the one that we've declared. I believe in this one name. And today I believe he is Lord of my life. If you will do that with a sincere heart, the Bible says you will be saved. And we wanna celebrate with you. We, we wanna celebrate with the heavens that when God radically changes lives, there's a party in heaven for one sinner that has come to faith. Church, may we be a place shaken by the power and the presence of God because we live boldly for the one name under heaven by which men can be saved, the name of Jesus Christ. Father.